times uh, uh, a day. Uh, we see that uh, uh, two of them are in a negative copper balance, and two of them are still in a co uh, positive copper balance. As we go up to 50 milligrams, 75 milligrams, we start seeing more and a greater and greater percent of people falling below this line. And uh, uh, finally, when we get up to uh, 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 over uh, 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 75 milligrams dose to, uh, uh, at 25 milligrams three times a day, everybody's falling below the line. And similar, similarly here at 150 milligrams. So we see in split dosing, everyone is going into a negative copper balance. And this is basically some of the evidence behind why zinc works to block uh, copper uptake. Uh, prevent copper accumulation. So basically going back to 2000, uh, you know, there were hundreds of people treated with zinc and there obviously were uh, more people uh, uh, treated in special situations, which we'll talk about too. Obviously children uh, are one special situation and pregnant people are another special situation. But you can see that there's quite a bit of experience uh, using zinc at our center and obviously we've had a lot more experience over the last uh, uh, 13 years and uh, additionally throughout the world. Do you have a question? Yeah, actually, okay, you're taking zinc, it's blocking absorption, but what happens if you already have buildup of copper in the liver, in the brain, in the eyes? Does the zinc do anything to remove what's already present? Right, that's a good question. What she's basically asking is, uh, and, you know, zinc was approved for maintenance treatment. Does it have any benefit in terms of getting the copper down? And the answer to that is yes. You can make someone actually copper deficient with zinc if you, you know if you don't monitor what's going on with it. And that's because as you are in a negative copper balance, it's kind of like making a withdrawal from a bank account without ever making a deposit. If you keep staying in a negative copper balance over time, slowly the copper levels in the body will go down. So um, it's actually there are people who advocate using it as initial treatment uh, for many uh, uh, of these presentations. The problem with using it in initial treatment is that it can uh, uh, take a while to get that copper down. So if someone's having a lot of uh, neurologic injury or a lot of hepatic injury and they're just placed on zinc, it may not work rapidly enough. And so uh, that's a great question. Thank so kind of best to chelate it out first and then it, it varies. These are why the recommendations vary from okay. patient to patient. But you're right. Depending on the situation, there may be uh, 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 you know uh, uh, people who get chelated first and then are maintained with zinc or stay on chelation even as a maintenance treatment. So uh, basically, zinc was approved in 1997 uh, by the FDA, and it was approved for maintenance therapy. And that's why that was such a great question you just asked. Uh, so it was on my next slide. Uh, there's a, um, the trade name for it is Galzin, and it's manufactured and sold by Teva. Um, there's been a lot of long-term follow-up in these patients, and I just uh, point this out because uh, you know, there are people who've been on years of therapy. This is a paper that was published many years ago, and obviously we have now people who've been on zinc for decades and decades, and their urinary coppers are uh, uh, holding steady over that time, and uh, what we call a thera our therapeutic target, which is to have the urinary coppers uh, 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 below 100 or below 125 micrograms per 24 hours for most patients. Similarly, the urinary zinc levels uh, remain elevated, and this is uh, what we follow here. Our goal is to have it over 2 milligrams in general for 24 hours, and you can see these patients who are taking their zinc uh, have uh, uh, maintained that effect to keep their urinary zinc elevated. So those are the two parameters we like to monitor in everyone at least a couple time collections a year uh, looking at their urinary copper and their urinary zinc that lets us know that they're doing well and they're not being over decoppered because that can be a problem. If someone stays on it too long, they can uh, become copper deficient. And so just like a doctor wouldn't put somebody on a, a blood pressure medicine, and then never check their blood pressure again, or put a diabetic on insulin and then never check their blood sugar again. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, we don't put people on copper reduction therapy and then never monitor their copper status again. We like to do that in an ongoing fashion. So um, uh, obviously, it's, uh, uh, I realize others here uh, know a lot more about uh, uh, neurology than I do, but uh, I just wanted to comment on uh, sort of what the neuro kinds of neurologic uh, recovery are uh, in some patients treated with zinc. 
And here, basically, uh, what we see is a, you know, a, a neurologic test score, uh, um, and zero means no neurologic dysfunction, or in this case, speech, uh, a score of zero means no speech dysfunction, seven is severe speech dysfunction, and here, uh, uh, 38 is severe neurologic dysfunction. And we see that it improves over a period of two years uh, on treatment, and then tends to stabilize. Similarly here with speech. So the first two years of treatment are real important uh, after initial diagnosis, and then symptoms tend to stabilize. Does that mean that uh, uh, nobody gets better after two years? No, these are aggregated data. You know, I've met people who didn't walk for you know, 10 years, and then they were able to walk again, you know, and things like that. Uh, so I don't want it to be discouraging for any individual person. And yet at the same time, in terms of aggregated data, uh, the average recovery is achieved by two years, and after that, we're really uh, um, dealing with neurologic uh, uh, problems that may be more persistent. Uh, in terms of uh, pediatric disease, uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, this is a special age group because they're growing and they need uh, copper to grow. Uh, and so, we don't want to interfere with growth, and we want uh, uh, them to develop normally. Obviously, um, uh, they're also changing in size, so the dose may be different for a small child than for a full-grown adult. And so these are some general cutoffs that we use in terms of dosing of zinc. Um, and I just uh, uh, sort of point that out uh, because some people may have questions about that. Uh, obviously, uh, these treatments can be individualized. I'd also like to talk about some of the work of others. Here's an uh, article from Italy looking at uh, uh, the use of zinc in a pediatric patient group. Uh, and this was a 10-year follow-up study published in 2005. And basically uh, what they found was these were children who were diagnosed and they basically had abnormal liver function tests. And they showed that at five years and at 10 years, their liver function tests were normal. And in, in the beginning, you know, these normal ranges are generally less than 35. Um, you know, their baseline levels were 109 and 94 for these liver enzymes. And so monitoring liver enzymes is another thing we like to uh, monitor at least annually, if not uh, twice a year. And then uh, urine copper uh, is a, uh, another thing, obviously, which is monitored here, and they basically showed that these urine copper levels were stable in these children on zinc. Uh, they also showed a reversal of some of the uh, uh, scar tissue uh, here, uh, 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 reversing some of the fibrosis in these patients. Scar tissue is graded in, the, in, the, in this grading system from one to four, and you can see uh, at the time of initial uh, diagnosis, there were some people uh, who had scores of uh, one, uh, which meant very little fibrosis, and uh, 10 people had scores of uh, three or greater, and uh, basically on follow-up, only four of them had scores of three or greater, and 18 uh, uh, now had scores of one. So some of the scar tissue actually melted away with treatment of the copper overload. And uh, 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 similarly, uh, inflammation went way down. You can see here the inflammation went away. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, these liver biopsy findings show that getting rid of the copper was, uh, excess copper was good for the liver. I also want to mention briefly the treatment of pregnant people with uh, uh, Wilson's disease. And, you know, uh, we studied, published a study with 26 pregnancies treated in 19 women. Um, the health of the mother was well protected when using zinc, and there were two birth defects. There are about a 1 to 3 percent incidence of major birth defects in every birth in people without Wilson disease. So it's a little hard to know. I do point out that triantine and penicillamine are uh, ranked uh, you know, in terms of warnings as being more uh, teratogenic. So that's something to consider uh, for the person who's becoming pregnant. Obviously, uh, zinc has some toxicity. Gastric irritation is a problem. Uh, it's generally worse when first started, worse with the uh, first morning dose. Um, so oftentimes I'll shift the first morning dose to mid-morning. You can use some protein with the offending agents. And this is present in some, but not all patients. So there's some people who take it and have no side effects, and there are other people who take it, and they always have side effects. And so we have to be aware of that, obviously. With any of these drugs, whether they're chelation or zinc, there's a potential for over-treatment copper deficiency. And so we need to monitor uh, urine and copper uh, dose uh, levels and back off on the zinc dose if the copper falls too low. And so uh, uh, 
obviously this requires some input on both the patient to do the collections and uh, bring them to their physician and then the physician to look at the collections and make adjustments if needed. Uh, we try and avoid, avoid making excessive numbers of adjustments uh, because obviously uh, it's important to have a routine and stick with it as long as it's worth it. Um, once some of the uh, uh, evidence of copper deficiency can be anemia and or leukopenia, which means a low hemoglobin, hematocrit, a low white count. Those can be signs that someone is getting uh, copper deficient. Uh, obviously, those can be low for other reasons, too, so it needs, it needs to be evaluated in concert uh, with your physician. I'd like to talk a little bit about neurologic worsening on therapy. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about, and we only have a, a short amount of time, but this is a major issue that's uh, near and dear to us because um, people do worsen on treatment uh, even when, it, uh, when they're initially diagnosed, even when it's started. Um, in people with uh, 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 neurologic symptoms, so people who come in with some of those dystonias and tremors and so forth that were described, with uh, penicillamine and triantine, uh, there's about a 25 to up to a 50% incidence of worsening with penicillamine and about 25% with triantine has uh, been our experience. Um, the mechanism is not really uh, extremely well defined, but we think we're uh, probably mobilizing copper stores in the body and that's causing copper to uh, uh, become uh, uh, available and further elevate uh, uh, brain uh, copper potentially or potentially uh, 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 just free copper floating around and uh, not getting it under control in the brain maybe contributing to the copper toxicity. Um, and uh, you know, I point out patients who experience neurologic worsening very often but not always never fully recover and so we used to have clinical um, uh, uh, trials with these patients where we video them at the beginning and at the end of their treatment. And some people were amazed at how, much, how many neurologic deficits they had because they walked in at the end of two years and they were completely normal and they don't even remember not being able to talk or not being able to walk well or having a tremor and so forth. So uh, obviously there are a lot of success stories, but as I pointed out in the data, there are some people who have so subtle neurologic uh, problems that persist and some that are not so subtle. So this is an area uh, that's really an unmet need in Wilson's disease. In terms of neurologic worsening, uh, you know, we did uh, a couple of studies with tetrathiamolybdate. Uh, these were uh, studies done with TM uh, in combination with zinc. One was an open label study in which two of 55 patients of neurologic worsening. So that's about 3.6%. So obviously that's a little better than 25 to 50%. Um, finally, uh, uh, we did a, a comparator study where we're com comparing TM plus zinc versus triantine plus zinc. Uh, and in, in this uh, one out of 25 or 4% of the people treated with TM showed neurologic worsening. While six of 23 or 26% treated with triantine showed neurologic worsening. And these were randomized blinded studies where you know, neither the patient nor the nurses and uh, treating physician knew which drug they were on. Uh, and so uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, we did see these differences, which suggests to us that TM may be a better treatment uh, for these uh, people with neurologic deterioration. In terms of the uh, liver presentation, because I only have a few minutes left, and I know you're interested in all these different things, uh, there's basically a, a variable hepatic presentation with mild or uh, 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 pre-symptomatic. These are people that just have mild elevations of ASTALT, oftentimes can be treated with zinc monotherapy. Uh, chronic cirrhosis can progress to liver failure, and people can have ascites and so forth, and we often use a combination of triantine and zinc when treating these people with more severe liver symptoms. And obviously there's a much rarer uh, acute pulmonary presentation where people are walking around feeling well one day and the next day they're in an intensive care unit uh, getting a liver transplant. So, um, so basically I just point out that uh, zinc works well with triantine as well. Uh, and here's uh, some patients that we treated that were actually quite ill from their liver disease. And I, I just put up these data to show some of the data that we look at include an albumin level, uh, a blood clotting time, bilirubin. We obviously uh, score people using uh, the presence or absence of ascites. All, all these patients had quite a bit of symptoms, or a couple who didn't have ascites, but the majority of them did. 
And then uh, we use this uh, child Turcotte Pew score uh, uh, to score these patients. Five is normal, and these people were all quite ill uh, on this scoring system. And there's another scoring system I like to, to, to remind people of because it's specific to Wilson's disease. There's a NASR scoring system, and Dr. Dewan has come up with a, a, a modification to it. But basically, this scoring system was from, uh, from before tra uh, transplant was available. And this is a score that can help predict who's going to pass away uh, from Wilson's disease uh, with medical treatment and who's going to uh, uh, potentially uh, survive with medical treatment and might not need a liver transplant. And so all these patients uh, were treated with trientine and zinc and basically uh, at recovery they all had normal albumins uh, uh, and recovered their uh, uh, clotting times and their normalized their bilirubins as well. So you can see some of these people were uh, quite ill and did better. Part of this has to do, and this is sort of Greek mythology, and uh, this is a little bit of an arc here, but uh, uh, basically I remember the bird who would uh, go and peck away at the liver every day, and uh, then the liver would regenerate, and that's uh, uh, sort of what we're taking advantage of in the uh, liver world, is the ability of the liver to regenerate once this uh, toxicity has been removed. And I'm just going to show some liver biopsy slides very quickly. Uh, you can see here the blue is bad. The blue is uh, scar tissue, and this is someone at the time of initial diagnosis. And this is their same, the same person biopsied several years later, where you can see that scar tissue, that blue rim, has faded quite a bit. And then uh, uh, biopsied several years later, and there's hardly any of that blue scar tissue there. So uh, um, the, that damage has an ability to be reversed with removal of the copper. Uh, obviously, there are treatment successes and failures. I point out that transplant is an option for some people, but um, it does have complications. 20% of people develop renal failure from their renal uh, immunosuppressions. 10-year mortality is about 46%. Uh, I mean, 46% of people have died 10 years after a liver transplant. Uh, it's probably a little better for Wilson's disease than that, but, but uh, it, there certainly are uh, concerns. You don't have a normal life expectancy. 20 and got a liver transplant. There's obviously an increased incidence of cardiac disease, cancer, and infections in Wilson's patients who've been transplanted. And uh, about a third of the late deaths are due to failure of the liver graft, but the remainder are due to uh, heart disease, stroke, malignancies, infections, or other uh, problems. So uh, getting a liver transplant isn't sort of a, uh, a free ride, although people who have Wilson's disease and get liver transplants no longer have to uh, regulate their copper because it's new genes from the new liver are regulating the copper at that point. So one of the things that I uh, like to emphasize when I'm talking with patients is the importance of monitoring therapy and actually taking therapy. Um, zinc is, uh, you know, in my opinion, the least toxic of the treatments. The main concern is GI upset. But for uh, whatever treatment's being taken, there's a potential for over-treatment and under-treatment. So these drugs can potentially uh, either uh, uh, not do enough copper reduction or do too much, and so it's important to be monitoring. Urine testing and uh, uh, blood testing monitoring is important, uh, and obviously if you're taking a chelator, you need to watch for toxicities that are unique to those drugs. As I've talked about uh, uh, briefly, penicillamine uh, can induce a lupus-like syndrome, uh, autoimmune-like uh, uh, syndrome just from the drug. Uh, there also can be a B6 uh, deficiency induced by penicillamines. People taking penicillamine need to be sure to be taking that vitamin. Uh, and uh, they can have kidney toxicities. And uh, virtually everyone taking penicillamine also gets skin changes. They can get um, uh, uh, changes on the neck called progeric skin changes, which is sort of give a premature aging appearance. And there can be other uh, skin changes that are even more difficult and hard to uh, treat. So you obviously need to watch for those. But I think the biggest problem, if you have to come up with one problem in terms of treatment, uh, and I don't mean to, uh, you guys are all motivated and you're all here and interested in your disease, so I think you're probably not the people I need to point this out to. Uh, but the biggest problem is non-adherence to treatment. Um, in other words, since this is a chronic problem, and it's there all the time, it's easy to be lulled into a sense of, uh, gee, I'm doing well, I don't really need to take all this medicine, or I don't need to really collect that here and it's a bother, or I don't need to do this or that. Uh, and so non-adherence or not taking the treatment or not doing the testing is probably the single biggest issue in uh, terms of treatment.
So if I can summarize now, since my half hour is uh, uh, pretty much up, um, there's sort of two phases uh, to treatment. There's an initial therapy and a maintenance therapy. Uh, zinc is generally well tolerated, uh, uh, although some people have GI side effects, and for some people that requires a switch to a different treatment. Uh, usually that can be uh, adjusted by changing timing of doses and uh, how it's taken. Um, it can, zinc can be used effectively in combination with other therapies, and the initial therapy is symptomatic for some disease. Trientine has emerged as the chelator of choice, I think, around the world at this point, although there are some physicians who still use penicillamine as first-line therapy. It's, there are fewer and fewer of those. I just point out that trientine can be associated with neurologic toxicity, marotoxicity, arthritis, which means joint aches and other side effects, so we do need to you know, keep an eye out for those. One of the exciting things about trientine is, uh, you know, my colleague Dr. Silsky is studying its use dose once a day, which potentially uh, can be used to, you know, increase adherence to treatment. Um, and uh, obviously that, uh, that, that is exciting. Uh, what worries me a little bit, obviously, is there's no safety. If you're only taking one dose a day and you forget that one dose, then you're not taking anything. But if you're taking it twice a day, so paradoxically, this uh, maneuver of uh, increasing adherence uh, also leaves you a little bit more vulnerable. Uh, there's certainly a compelling need for new treatments uh, like tetrathiamolybdate in the neurologic presentation, and, uh, uh, and treatment adherence and uh, kappa reduction therapy need to be monitored, and that's probably the most important thing uh, that I need to uh, uh, um, emphasize. Uh, and so basically, uh, I think right now, the, you know, the current treatments, maintenance, some people are using trientine, Obviously, uh, zinc can be used. I want to point out, too, that trientine was approved for, uh, when I told you initially I was discussing some off-label uses of drugs here, trientine was approved as a salvage treatment for people who had toxicity to penicillamine. So the FDA really only looked at five or ten patients that had been treated who had toxicity from penicillamine. In other words, they couldn't take penicillamine anymore, and they were going to die from copper toxicity. And so... Uh, our colleagues in the United Kingdom gave them uh, uh, trientine, and they got better, and they tolerated the drug. So they went to the FDA and said, please approve this drug for use in Wilson's disease. And they did, but the, but, but the uh, approval for a trientine really was only for treatment failures to penicillamine. And the reason I come back to that is it just hasn't been studied as extensively. We, we studied it in our randomized trial. Uh, there are a number of other papers, obviously, coming out now. Most of those are, uh, in effect, what I would call uh, retrospective studies, looking back at uh, treatment uh, and seeing how it went. Um, but we, what we do need, uh, obviously, to pay attention to that. Um, obviously, pre-symptomatic, you can use zinc, you can use trientine. Pregnancy, I, I strongly prefer zinc, and I like to run the urine copper levels a little bit higher in pregnancy. You know, around the 100 to 125 microgram range, uh, so that way we're trying to balance the health of the mom with the health of the baby. Um, obviously, in pediatric illness, uh, I think uh, zinc is generally well tolerated and allows for growth of the child without the risk of them becoming sick from the treatment or over copper reduction. Some kids can't tolerate it or they have more aggressive disease and need trientine as well, uh, so obviously that, that'll be used. For initial hepatic, right now, we're using trientine and zinc. Uh, obviously, if they need a liver transplant and aren't going to respond to treatment, we look at that NASR score, and that helps us determine whether uh, uh, they'll respond to a treatment or not. In terms of neurologic treatment and psychiatric, I think tetrathiamolybdate is the drug of choice. The reason I put a question mark there is it's not approved by the FDA, so it's not readily available. Uh, and obviously, uh, zinc can be used as well. Uh, some of my colleagues are uh, uh, advocating using lower doses of trientine to treat this cohort, but uh, uh, you know, I think people still deteriorate even on those low doses, and it's a problem. So we certainly need to look at developing these, uh, um, uh, these new treatments. And so with that, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators, colleagues, the FDA and NIH who funded a lot of these studies, as well as our uh, General Clinical Research Center, which uh, uh, where a lot of these patients stayed during the studies, and, uh, and thank the uh, meeting organizers for their kind invitation. I'll call on Mary.
ready to introduce our next speaker? Thank you. 